No. Yeah. Okay, so welcome everyone and thanks for the kind introduction, Michael. My name is Gabor Sarnyas and I'm a final year PhD student from Budapest, Hungary. And in this short talk, I will talk about how to make better software with graphs. So, as Michael said, JavaScript has some sort of bad name to it, but it's difficult to dispute that it's very popular. So if you go on Stack Overflow, it's consistently ranked among the top languages with respect to the number of questions asked. And it's getting standardized, so there is a standards body that releases a new version of the standard each year called ECMA script. And essentially, uh, things are getting better uh, for the JavaScript community, it's getting a better language. I'm not going to say that it's the best language or it's like the top most popular language, but it's widely used from IoT devices to the browser. So it's important that we make good JavaScript code. And one of the techniques to guarantee good source code is called static analysis. The full name is static source code analysis, which means that we test software without compiling and executing it. So we take the source code, uh, do some analytics on the source code itself, and then try to uh, check rules and check violations of these rules on the source code. Uh, this is a complementary thing to the traditional testing. So basically in most continuous integration uh, systems nowadays, you have your development environment, you push code to the source code repository, it then gets compiled by the CI server, and it gets tested by unit tests and integration tests. And static analysis is sort of complementary to all that. It's a different step because it just reads the source code, does some analytics, and then as a separate feedback loop, it returns the results to the developer. This is quite popular, so I'm sure most of you have uh, seen some of the cloud services like Codacy, Cold Climate, and so on. But the problem with this is, is that this is an offline feedback loop. So you commit your code and then you receive an email 15 minutes later that your code is violating this and the, that rules. Another approach is to use uh, command line tools and ID integrated tools. If you have uh, done some C programming, there is an old Unix tool called Lint. This is uh, such a defining tool that actually it gave its name to the family of source code analytics tools called linters. And if you're a Java developer, you're probably aware of Finebox or PMD. And obviously there are tools for JavaScript. There is ESLint, Facebook's Flow Engine, the TurnJS system, and so on. So essentially these give pretty good coverage, but all of them have some drawbacks. Uh, we tried to do analytics over JavaScript in the past, and we found that there isn't a single system that allows users to define global rules, evaluate those rules efficiently, and can be extended by custom rules. So these are pretty difficult to satisfy at once. Obviously, others have thought of this problem as well. So uh, checking global rules is a computationally very expensive operation in a large source code repository. And this is actually so slow that it's sometimes even difficult to integrate to the CI workload. So obviously there are a couple of workarounds. The first workaround is just don't bother with global rules, write your code in a very modular, very separated way, and then use file level static analysis. ESLint for one does that. Uh, another workaround is to do some batching on your CI analytics. So you run your build and tests on each commit, but you only do a single analysis a day. And also, you can do some custom algorithms. So if you make your algorithm smart enough, it, it's going to be fast, but then it's going to be very difficult to extend with new rules. So in short, we made two important design considerations for the product. We wanted to create a static analysis uh, tool for JavaScript that allows users to define custom analysis rules, be those global or local, and it should provide high performance, ideally close to real-time evaluation. So if the user is editing the code in the development environment, the user should be able to receive timely feedback on the changes that they made. So one of the cornerstones of our approach is the architecture and the workflow. 
it's all built around incrementality, which means that we want to do some changes. Uh, we want to do the analytics in a way that it incorporates the changes made in the code. So uh, essentially, first it analyzes the source code on the whole, and then for each change, it uses incremental processing. So if only a single file is changed in a 15,000 file repository, it tracks the changes to that file. And second, we want to use a declarative query language. Now, if you're in the graph dev room, you can probably guess which declarative graph query language that is. Uh, we will get back to that in a moment. So this is the high level architecture of our system. It starts off with the version control system. All your code is committed to the version control system. It's then loaded to the workspace of the analyzer where it gets transformed to a syntax tree and it gets transformed to a semantic graphs. We then load this to the graph database and we get a set of analysis rules that we want to check and then we perform continuous checks on the server and give feedback to the client continuously. So, what are these steps? If you have ever uh, played around with a compiler, those should be very familiar because basically this is how most of the compilers work. Essentially, they start off with the source code, which is a sequence of statements. For example, this is a very simple source code which says we declare a variable foo, which is equal to one divided by zero. It uses a component called a tokenizer to split this into token into tokens. Tokens are the shortest meaningful uh, character sequences in the source code. So for this var foo equals uh, one slash zero, we get six tokens. The tokens then go through the parser, which builds the so-called syntax tree according to the grammar specification. For the source code line that we've seen, we get this syntax tree. And this is already uh, quite close to what we want to use, but this is still missing some semantic information. It's missing uh, on the scopes, which will be added by the scope analyzer, and it's missing on information on various accessibility features. So essentially the abstract semantic graph enriches the abstract syntax tree by adding some scope information. So we take this and add some more edges. Actually, once we have already added these edges, it's no longer a tree because it has some cross edges, uh, all the scopes are defined, and also the accessibility kind and other uh, meta information are added to the specific nodes. So this is like compiler construction in a nutshell. And you can see that even though we started off with a very simple experiment, like six tokens, a single line of code, we get more than 20 nodes, and this can be a lot more. So for a very sophisticated line of code, we can get 50 to 100 nodes easily. So these graphs are pretty large. However, once we have these graphs, we can do all sorts of pattern matching. I said that we are going to use a declarative graph pattern language, and this is Cypher. So if you have a graph like this, and you know a bit of Cypher, you can actually specify validation rules. For example, you don't want your code to do divisions by zero, so you create this rule which matches the binding identifiers that are in a binary expression, then do a filtering where the expression is a division and the right value is a zero, and then do a projection operation to return the binding. And this is very useful for the developer because the developer can fix that instantly. It's a well-known truth that the sooner the developer gets feedback on the errors that they made, the, the cheaper it is to fix these errors. So ideally, we should give the developers uh, timely feedback on the mistakes they made in the code. So workflow-wise, it starts with the developer's IDE and the version control system. As a first step, code is loaded for the, from the version control system and transformed to tokens, AST and ASG step by step. Then it's transformed by a set of Cypher queries and Java code and it's loaded to the graph database. And once we have this, we trace the 
core issues of the errors back to the source code and display the errors in the developer's IDE. So once we have a workflow that like this running, actually it allows us to do very cool things. One of my favorite ones is type inferencing because uh, as you know, JavaScript is a dynamic language and it's very easy to write code that throws runtime errors because of type violations. Obviously, there are some workarounds for this. You can use TypeScript or other typed flavors of JavaScript, but you have a lot of legacy JavaScript code that's written in plain JavaScript and type inferencing is key to use those uh, in a way that will not return errors while, uh, while running the, the code. So, uh, another use case is global analytics. Because we have this graph, we can do a lot of cool reachability style queries. We can do dead code detection. We can do a detection of async awaits where you run an async and it's dangling somewhere in the code, but you never do an await on that piece of asynchronous call. And you can do potential division by zero detections by propagating these uh, issues to the code. So you can check whether value can be zero at the point of the time that it's evaluated. Some tech details I think will be very interested, interesting for uh, this audience. Uh, one of the key issues in implementing all this is that imports and exports are just crazy in ECMA script. You have a dozen ways to import and even more to export. So we have drawn this nice matrix of compatibility. And just to give you an idea of how long it takes to implement all this, a single black dot which says that uh, that's compatible needs like 15 lines of quite complex cipher code to, to work with. So it's a lot of work to cover all these. And obviously, once we have this, we have to implement the algorithms. Now, as I said, we have some propagation algorithms where we want to propagate some property along the graph, be that the type information or the fact that this value can be zero or not. Uh, this is actually something that's called run to completion scheduling. So we give a set of transformation rules to the system and then ask the system to execute it until there are no more changes to execute. Uh, this is actually quite difficult to do in, in plain Cypher. So we use a mix of Java code and Cypher code and the Java code does the propagations uh, while it can. Another thing that we struggled with is efficient initialization of the database state. So in the first implementations, the initial build of the graph happened with uh, Cypher statements. So we built the graph pretty much node by node with uh, separate Cypher statements. And this obviously was quite slow. So we started to think around this with a bit and used CSVs to generate uh, the graph. So in the as the first step, we generated just two CSV files, one for the nodes and one for the relationships, and then used the Neo4j import tool to load it to the database. This is not a very sophisticated approach. You could do multiple CSVs or binaries or other things, but already this gave us a 10x speed up. So it's actually uh, like one day's of work and uh, the initial load went down from an hour to a couple of minutes. We also stumbled upon regular path queries quite regularly uh, because there are a lot of cases when we need transitive closure on certain combinations. So for example, you can have a situation when you have a function that's assigned to a variable that's in another function that's assigned to another variable and so on transitively. And essentially we would want to do a transitive closure style operation on those relationship types. The problem is that it's not supported by Cypher yet, so we uh, created a workaround. The workaround is, let's start a transaction at some proxy relationships that uh, sort of go over those relationships, do a calculation for a transitive closure on those proxy relationships, and then roll the transaction back and essentially deleting those edges from the graph. This is 
I think, a proper workaround, but it's not the nicest way to express it. And obviously, uh, the Cypher team is very well aware of this. So for the next open Cypher, there's a proposal for creating path patterns. This allows users to create an expression where there are uh, several relationships type uh, next to each other and then do a transitive closure style operation on that. Okay, so I said that incrementality is very important in this work and actually this was my motivation to start working on this topic. Um, so as I said, we built our system uh, around Cypher queries. As you probably know, there is now an initiative called Open Cypher, which aims to deliver a standard specification of the Cypher query language. It was released about two years ago, and it's been actually adapted by industrial vendors that are uh, listed on the logos, and there are also a couple of research prototypes. Most notably, there is Graphflow, which is developed by the University of Waterloo, and there is Ingraph, which is my PhD project. And interestingly enough, both of these target the same goal. It's the incremental processing of Cypher queries. So you have a set of Cypher queries and you can evaluate them incrementally, continuously in your system. If you're interested in some of the details, last year I was here in the same room giving a talk about the system in Graph. And here are a couple of my slides. So the way in Graph works is to first compile the open Cypher queries to relational algebra and then transform that relational algebra to a representation that's incrementally maintainable and then use an incremental relational engine to calculate the result of those queries. In the last year, we expanded InGraph by a lot of new features. It now covers a substantial fragment of the open Cypher language, including subqueries, functions, aggregations, some of the data manipulation operations like create or delete. And there are some features missing on the roadmap like merge, remove, and uh, more sophisticated uh, expressions like list comprehensions. But it's getting nicely together and the state of InGraph uh, almost allows us to evaluate the uh, most important JavaScript static analysis queries. So it's possible in theory, we have two papers on that. Uh, one is about the compilation of Cypher queries to algebra, and the other is on the incremental maintenance of those relational algebraic expressions. So this is, I think, a very cool use case for InGraph. Um, so as Michael said, his pet peeve is software analytics, and I think this is an area that's very important. We, as developers, we should strive to make better software. And others have realized the need for this and the usefulness of graphs for uh, understanding code and analyzing code. So there is a tool called JQ Assistant. It's uh, basically a code comprehension tool that scans the software, turns into a graph, and then you can use arbitrary cipher queries to understand the code, and you can register a set of validation queries that you want to check on each build. There is a blog post on this on the Neo4j blog. Uh, there is also Slicer, which is closely tied to JQ Assistant. This is actually an interactive front end on top of JQ Assistant. And the idea is the same. You take a bunch of jar files, uh, Java files, and so on, throw it at the system, it scans it, loads it to the database, and then you can use this interactive Cypher editor to visualize and discover your system. It actually has an Eclipse-based IDE, and as part of that IDE, it has a grammar to provide an editor. And funnily enough, as part of the InGraph project, we managed to extend that grammar uh, by some new features. We actually added some features that were introduced in the Opus Cypher language recently. We added a scope analyzer, and you know, uh, you might think that uh, you're not using Eclipse, so this is not very relevant, but actually Xtext is quite independent from Eclipse, so you can run it in the web UI. So this is an editor which allows you to refactor Cypher queries correctly. If you do a refactoring operation, you can actually change the value of uh, of a variable and then it will trace it back through the query. Okay, to wrap up, um, 
If you found all this interesting, we have two thesis works on this from 2016 and 2017. These are very well written and nicely illustrated works, and uh, I think they are quite uh, pleasant reads. So all these are clickable if you're interested. And as a conclusion, I think uh, it's fair to say that interesting analysis rules, at least some of them, require a global view of the code. So it's not enough to just scan a file and do a standard linter style analysis. Instead, you should use some graph representation for your source code. And property graph databases are definitely a good fit for this. They are very expressive, and the Cypher query language is quite easy to use and easy to understand. And uh, in particular, these are very good use cases for incremental graph queries. So if you make sure that your system incorporates incrementality on multiple levels, you can end up with a system that's fast enough for real-time uh, answers. These are the related resources that you can find on GitHub. Uh, bear in mind that these are all academic prototypes, so they work some of the time on some use cases. They are more like proof-of-concept softwares. And I would like to thank the whole team that worked on this, the students, uh, my colleagues, and Adam. Actually, Adam Lippe is my old friend, and he's giving a talk in the source code analysis dev room tomorrow. So if you came here just for the JavaScript part and you were... Uh, left unsatisfied, you can go there tomorrow at 4.20 and uh, attend his talk. Thank you for your attention. Okay, questions? I have one hour worth of questions to you. Can we talk? Yeah, we can talk. Uh, we can talk here offline. Yeah, Absolutely. So we have... Um, 12 more spaces for an after FOSTEM graph dinner. So if some of you want to join us there, and if you want to join to talk to Gabor, feel free to come along after our next talk. But any other questions for Gabor? Yeah. Hi there. Um, hey. As someone with a Firefox code base, we have a little bit of JavaScript. OK. <laughs> um, what kind of um, OK, so um, uh, let me repeat the question. Uh, the gentleman is from Firefox, I understand. So, yeah. Okay, so the question is what code repositories we have tried uh, our code on. So you're probably concerned about scalability. Obviously, we went on GitHub and uh, grabbed a couple of the source code repositories. Most notably, there is Trezorit, which is a cloud storage system, so it's like Dropbox, but it's more focused on encryption and security. And their front-end library is approximately 70,000 yeah, 70, lines of JavaScript code. And that was the one that took us like an hour to load, and then we optimized it, and it went down like to like five, six minutes. Uh, so that was the largest one that we have used. And we had a lot of struggle to get a parser that works well because we tried the Babel parser, and the problem with that was that it doesn't really provide scope information. So it's just the EST, and it's very difficult to work with. But this logo here is the logo of Shape Security, the uh, S on the figure, and they have a very well written uh, library called Shift dash Java, that's an AST builder, but that has a lot of scoping information. Uh, that's a very nicely written piece of software, actually. It's beautiful Java code. The problem with it is it's not really maintained. So it's uh, well written, and we have to maintain it now because uh, it's, it seems abandoned. And we actually started to add the ECMA script 2017 features, like async and await, uh, to, to the parser, which is a work in progress now. Okay, any other questions? Yes? Yeah, you were saying about real time yeah. quite a lot in your presentation. Now, what I'm interested in, what are you quantifying as real time for this situation in terms of metrics? Okay, so the question was uh, um, what do I quantify as real time? Yeah. Well, um, essentially, uh, it should be quick enough for developers to appear while they are working on the same file. So you're writing your file, 
make some changes, you press, you know, control S, command S, and it should pop up uh, next to the other error. So it should be sub-second, ideally. But the reason why I'm asking is different size of code. Yep. Give you different timings, would it, in terms of checking? Yeah, so... so Average, yeah. So the follow-up question was: uh, different size of code repositories will mean different uh, different execution times, and whether there is like an average that it should take. Uh, well, for this, uh, actually, we plan to use the InGraph engine more extensively. The whole idea of InGraph is is to build a huge cache on your code, on on your uh, queries, and once you have that cache, you can do I won't say constant time, but very, very quick uh, query evaluations because you have all the interim results of your uh, queries uh, cached. So essentially, if you just want to introduce a small change, which you usually do while developing, it should be very quick and it should stay within second range. And the other thing is also that these graph queries for the uh, for the analysis are often local queries, so they don't touch the whole whole code base or whole graph, yep. but something in the neighborhood of this variable or something in the neighborhood of these functions or all the, you know, corners of this function or something like that, but they don't touch, like, everything that's in the code base, right? And that's why it's also less code uh, size dependent because most of these queries are local queries. So. Yeah, but I, I, you know, I'm not an experienced JavaScript developer, but I believe there is also a need for queries that are global, like reachability stuff. Is this code st is this piece of code still reachable? Uh, is this still correct from a typing perspective, and so on? So you can think of of uh, global queries as well. Did you ever do a structure uh, detection so that, that you can kind of run something like a graph algorithm on on top of the data to identify? things that would actually belong into modules, but are, that currently are not modules? And like that. No, but that's like more motif detection. Mm -hmm. So the question was whether we try to identify patterns in the graph, and no. Uh, but that's a very interesting, like a mixture of network science and, and yep. source code analytics. So that's, that's a good suggestion. Thanks. Cool. Okay, one last question, I think. Uh, the the yeah. Yeah, so uh, Facebook Flow actually uh, uses custom algorithms to make the uh, evaluation very efficient. So, uh, I th so from what I understand, it does a few things and does those very well and very quickly, but it's very difficult to extend Flow with your custom rules. So if you say that my company policy is that you cannot do uh, this and that in the code and I want to enforce this with... Uh, my static analysis tool, then that's not a very good fit. That's, that's I think, the key difference. Yeah, something that we uh, do in JQ system as well is kind of enriching the graph. So you have the original source yeah. graph, and then, like Gabo said as well, with, for instance, the scoping information, you can then take this original source graph and enrich it with new technical concepts or uh, actual uh, business concepts as well, depending yeah. on your and then actually formulate your cipher queries on top of these higher level concepts. You don't have to talk about like variables and, and expressions and functions, but you can say, you know, kind of all tests in my code base should have this and this attribute, for instance, or all, uh, all um, I don't know, component uh, code should have this and that, uh, you know, style or whatever. Right? So you can kind yep. of move a lot of these things to a higher level abstraction when you then write the queries on top of these concepts. And JQ Assistant does that for Java code already, so yeah. that's... Cool. If you want to contribute to any of these uh, source code analysis frameworks with, with graphs, please reach out to Gabo or me, and uh, yeah. we are more than happy to take it. Yeah, we, would need, we could use some help, so <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Cool stuff. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you again. Thanks a lot. Okay, in our last uh, talk, we'll have uh, Etienne talking about uh, use of graphs in uh, medical records and... So when does the dinner start? Uh, at six. Six, so we live together from here, I suppose? Yeah. Okay.
Hey, uh, like stick or or um, yeah, I'm or from presenter. And if you want, that's all the list of parser or something like that it, that exists written in JavaScript for us, oh. passing the AST and everything. Like that. I don't have a pa USB stick. <laughs> yeah, regrettably. Uh, uh, but can you just? Uh, email me the link or something. Uh, it takes time to just go through everything okay, okay, and take okay. the link. So yeah, yeah, but just, just can... zip it and uh, put it in Dropbox. My, that's on my hardest, but yeah, I can zip it. And... Okay. Can I give you a, like a business card or? Yeah, I have it somewhere. Let me check. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Can you please share your presentation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's already online, I think. Ah, online. So I, I did put it online. Uh, uh, was the link on the last slide? I, I'm not sure. No, no, uh, but... Ago, I started with a project where I promised to do JavaScript analysis. Oh, so cool. I of it. Okay, I'm and just going to get to... I give up because I, I went to a one-year oh, sabbatical to do in the eye, but we're happy to share oh, yeah. it. Because I, you know, we are supposed to put them online like half an hour before the talk. I did that, so I hope it works. Okay. Uh, oops. No, no, no. We. I think we took that. Mine. Yeah. Do you need both? Yeah, but two uh, on the... Uh, no, no, only the... Uh, only What's the, that? The hey. Yoda, he should not talk to you. Okay. Uh, this one. I think I should move the dog after you, right? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry? I want to ask you a few questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, but I think there's a talk here, so maybe... Yeah, let's talk soon. Sorry, or did you want to follow it? Um, I can ask you a question. I think we can talk. We can talk. Uh, I'm just gonna shut this down. Mm -hmm. So no internet connection. Uh, actually, actually, my phone is. Room? Because you are well, student, yeah, but so I, you should be able to access AV room. I am, but it never works on my Linux uh, because you of. You write credentials. Yeah, but it just never works okay. for me. Uh, it should be. Well, it should I work. Use Linux and, it works for me, so. and also on my phone. Ah, the sides are here. Yeah. Uh, here they are. So, ah, okay. Great. so you should should be able to see. It. May I your business card? Please? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I will give the microport to. Oh yeah. Back. No. So we'll have. Like